Welcome to Barbell Logic Rewind. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Scott Hambrick, and I got, of course, Matt Reynolds with us today. And we're going to talk about grinding. In the past, we talked about... Yeah, you know, it's like college age. Woo. No. Not that kind of grinding? Not that kind of grinding. Do you know that the... Okay, never mind. <laughs> I was going <laughs> to... Go ahead. Well, no, it's fine. I'm not going to go there. So I was going to tell the story of my wife and I, but I oh, I in our early years... Oh, I'm not going to tell the story. Well, you're, yeah, you're, I'll be you in trouble. still do that and be a virgin. Yeah, we uh, were. The... God, I'm, you just blew my mind. Sorry. So a couple so of episodes good. ago, we talked about, you know, things that cause people to fall out of linear progression, you know, pitfalls, right? And one of them is not knowing how to grind. And so we, we've got enough to say about this. We can make a whole episode yeah. about it. How do you grind properly? So take it. Well, I throw on a TLC album. And <laughs> is that what it was? Don't is that what it was? go chasing waterfalls. Is that what it was? Yeah, we grind. No, <laughs> that's not it at all. <laughs> so, that was your go-to My song. mind's telling me no. But my body, my body's telling me yes. We just had a bunch of followers. So that's R. Kelly. That's R. Kelly, by the way. Can so you, that's bump and, honor? That's bump and grind. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay. So grind for real. You need to be able to move the bar so slow that you might actually shit your pants. Yeah, that you can't tell it's moving. Yeah. So let's start with what people think is going on. So before we like joke about it and talk about the real serious part of this. I taught my mom who's 63 how to how to deadlift. She's not listening to this, so it's because I've already seen Bump and Grind by R. Kelly. Uh but I taught her how to deadlift and she had great form. She, had, she actually was I was really surprised how good her form was. And I got her up to her first uh, 100 pound deadlift. She deadlifted 100 pounds and started to pull the bar and the bar moved incredibly fast all the way to lockout. Right. And the whole time it was moving she was she said uh, oh my god oh my god it's so heavy it's so heavy it's so She's heavy. She's talking, right? She's talking during the thing. And uh, and then she set it back down, and she said, "Oh, son, son, that's so heavy, right?" Key indicator number one: if you can talk, it's not heavy. Yeah, right. So I stopped, and I, of course, I've had lots of out of town clients and clients over the years, same sort of thing. And I think here's the thing that we have to understand: a hundred pounds for my mom, who is sixty three, is the heaviest thing, maybe that she's ever picked up, and definitely yeah. is the heaviest thing she's picked up in four decades. Yeah, if you're not doing what you do, what we do. Yeah. You go get a friend one, you know? Yeah, of course, 100 pounds. Right. The thing is, is the bar speed told me that it wasn't heavy. When I say it's not heavy, I don't mean just not heavy to humanity in general. I mean, it wasn't heavy to her. Right. Because it bar moved fast. That's not a grind. Right. So our brains are built with a governor, like an engine is, that says, if it starts to move slow, put it back down. Right. But we have to learn how to overcome that. And when the bar moves insanely slow, we keep pulling or we keep pushing or we keep squatting or whatever it is. And so we have to learn how to grind because at the end of linear progression, everything is a grind. The first rep is usually a decent grind. And the second rep is a big grind. And the third and fourth and fifth oh. are insane right. grinds, right? And we can't continue to make progress and we can't get that refinement that we talk about every episode without learning how to do this. So if you have been coached by me, this is most easily learned on the deadlift because the deadlift starts at the right. bottom. I tell my clients, I've told every person who's ever been coached by me, I want five full seconds of grind before you put the bar down. So they start to deadlift. Even, and I tell them, even if you're positive that you can't get the weight, I still have to have yep. five full seconds seconds of grind because I need an appropriate stress to be able to recover from and then adapt to get stronger. And my body doesn't know. You have to benefit from that. You benefit from it. Of course you benefit from yep. it, right? Like it's a, it's a huge deal. My body doesn't know if I hit the weight or not. The only thing that knows that I hit the weight or not is my brain, is my own psyche, is my own confidence factor. And so if I pull on 700 pounds, which is near my max, 725 is my my max. I pull in 700 pounds and it stops at like mid shin, tibial yep. tuberosity, you know, two, three inches below the knee. And I grind and shake yep. and the bar just won't move. And I grind on it for two, three, four, five. Okay, it's not going to go. And I set it down six seconds, right? My body adapts to that. Yep. You'll get stronger for that. But if I pull in 700 pounds and it feels like it's not going to break off the floor, it feels like it's going to be too heavy. And I put it back down. There was nothing to adapt to. That's the problem. Yep. See, That's why we have to learn how to grind. And so you tell these people, that, I mean, I've heard, you've told me, I've heard you tell 100 people, 
five seconds of full effort. Yep. And they'll start the deadlift and you count back five, five four, four, three. So that's a big deal. So yep. your training partner needs to count for you. Yep. Five, four, three. Another thing I tell people is like, you can't quit. I'll tell you when you can quit. Yep. And I'll tell it, you when to put it down. It tells you, you know, if somebody's been training and I've been coaching them for a little while, that'll work. Yep. The five, four, three, two, one thing helps more for people that are uh, newer to training. If they trust me, I can tell them, you know, push, 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 <gasps> put it down and they'll put it down and, yep. and they get their good grind in. And so every lift has a spot that's tough, right? It's typically when one extends her hands off to another. Yep. Like, so in your deadlift, there's a hard spot, like, you know, a little over your mid shin yep. where your quads, are, spot. Ca- quads are kind of done working and it's handing it off to your hamstrings. Yep. And that's hard. It's no man's land. Yep. Those two muscle groups are not at their most efficient at that place. You know, it's kind of interesting. It's kind of funny. For all the years I've coached, I've never actually considered it the way you're saying it. But it, you're exactly right. It's when, when one muscle group, which is like kind of the major force in the lift, dissipates yep. and hands off to the next muscle group. And there's obviously overlap. Yeah. That's where the sticking point is, yeah. right? So where's the sticking point on the bench press? And the bench press is when your pecs are handed off your triceps. That's exactly right. right. That's exactly when it happens, right? So in the beginning, it's all like pecs and front delts. And then there's transitions away from the pecs and front delts into the triceps. And at that point where it transitions, that's where the sticking point is. Yeah. It's, and it's, there's normally two joints. Main The way I see it is two main joints in the lift, like in the squat. It's a knee and the hip, right? right. So you're almost out of your knee extension. Yep. And then you're in your hip extension, yep. and that's the hard spot. So your hamstrings, yeah, you're handing it off to your glutes. Your hamstrings are handed off to your glutes, actually. Yep. And so there's a hard spot in all these lists. So press has one, you know, about your hairline, yep, maybe hairline. a little, but maybe a little higher. Yep. Depends on what your how what your arm lengths are. So all of these have got a hard spot, and that's okay. It's okay, and it's okay for the bar to move slow. What's where it should move slow? By the that's way, where if it, 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 it does for you everybody. It, if you miss it at, a, at another spot, it's a form issue. That's right, or psychological. Yeah. So I had I went through a spell on the squat where I would get about five inches off the bottom, which is that spot. Yep. Five, maybe eight. You know, I don't know, five to eight inches somewhere in there, and it literally felt like the floor disappeared. <laughs> like I, there was nothing to push against. Mm. It wasn't that I didn't grind. I couldn't. Yep. And I have a friend, his name is Dick Gordon Jr. He's in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He's a guitar teacher and he's a savant and he's a straight up full tilt boogie genius. Okay. He's a psychologist. He used to see patients. They lay on the couch and do the whole damn thing. And he got tired of it because people were evasive. And he's also a fantastic guitarist. And he decided, well, I'm just going to teach guitar lessons. So when you go take guitar lessons from him, you're not getting guitar lessons. That guy's tearing your brain apart (laughs) because you can't hide. Yeah, right. So I'm going to tell my guitar story. exposes you. I'm going to tell my guitar story. This is my grinding story. So when I came to him, I was already an okay guitarist. Okay. And he wrote all of his own materials. I got to like chapter seven of these materials he wrote. And I'll never forget. I got to exercise 7C. And I would play. And he would put on like a click track or like a drum track. And he'd just play Mm -hmm. with the drum track. And I would stop. He said, look, Scott, uh, you know, when you play music, you can't stop. Like you can make a mistake, but this, but you know, people are dancing, people are listening. You got to go on, man. The drummer's still drumming, the bass player still. You got to play. All right, from the top, three, two, play, 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 and I get to the spot and stop. It's like, look, man, you can't stop. You can't. We did it again. Stop. He said, go <laughs> home, go home, practice this. Don't stop. Don't fuck. Don't stop. So I uh, went home, came back next week, and he said, we're gonna play this. And when you get to that spot, man, he's like, no, make a mistake. Drop the guitar, but you pick that mother. You don't stop. (laughs) And uh, he fired up the little drum track, you know, and I started playing this exercise and I stopped. And he took his glasses off and he rolled his rolling his office chair over and he got like an inch from my nose. And he said, did your parents not give you much validation as a child? (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, I don't know what that means. But the guy, the guy broke me like a glass rod, man. <laughs> I cried and cried and cried. And How and old were you? 34. <laughs> I don't know, something like that. And so we talked about it, and I found, we finally spent enough time on it that I learned when it got hard, I literally couldn't see anything. Right. The page went blank. I couldn't even see the music. And it had some root in like some fear of failure or something like that. Right. You know, so I just wouldn't even do it. Right. 
And luckily, I'm, I don't know, I'm sharp enough or whatever that, you know, most of the time stuff's not hard enough and I can just skate by and do right. better than a lot of folks and never get up against that. So I was squatting and the floor would disappear. Like I couldn't even push. Yep. Grind hell. Like I couldn't do anything. And I called Dick. I said, man, you know, this is what's happening and described it to him. He says the same thing, dude. Remember? I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Remember? He said, here's what I want you to do. He said, in that liminal time, like when you're in bed and you're not asleep yet, but you're relaxed and, you know, you're in that kind of liminal space, you know, he said, I want you to visualize that place where it gets really hard as a membrane that's like parallel to the ground. And he said, when, 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 you're, when you're relaxed, he said, I want you to picture yourself pushing and pushing through that membrane. And he said, I want you to do that every time that you're, you have nothing else to do. I want you to visualize that. And so when it gets hard, you push through that membrane. And it's just a membrane. Yep. That's all it is. And you just push through that. That's good. And I went back the week, next time. Like, I don't know. It, I was on a four-day split at the time, I think. And so I didn't, it wasn't, you know, the next day or whatever. Sure. So I had a little bit of time. And I could push. Yep. So anyway, I don't know if that's everybody's problem. But there's stuff going on. Sure. Like there's a lot of, you know, 90% of the time people... Um, just are quitting too early, you know? Sure. They're just quitting too early. But sometimes we have to practice that mentally. We have to go through the yes. mental exercise of like, what am I going to think? What is my experience going to be when I'm squatting here? How am I going to do this? Because if, if you try to figure out how you're going to grind when you're when it's time to grind, it's too late. Yeah, right. It's too late. You have to You've got to yeah. visualize you it. think through it now. The idea of the membrane you know, like a drum head, right? Yep. And you're going to push up through that with that squat, or you're going to pull that bar up through it with the deadlift. So useful. And you have yep. to practice, you know, what am I going to do? You have to visualize it and think about what am I going to do when that happens? What is that going to feel like? And how will I deal with it at that time? You've got to practice that when the bar is on your back. So when it's on your back, it's too late. Yep. That's good. Yeah. It's, it's weird because if you practice the other thing, which is failing, then you set the motor pattern to fail. Right. Which is what happens to a lot of people, right? So how often do we fail squats? How would you fail a squat? Not supposed to. I probably fail a squat once every 18 months. Oh. Uh, I, well, I do more than that, but. Yeah, I mean, but that's okay. Like once a year, once every six months, no, whatever. Like, months or something like that. I just like it's can't pretty do rare. You know, like I probably fail a deadlift more often. Yeah, more mentally and it doesn't break the ground if the deadlift comes off the ground i usually finish it i probably miss two deadlifts a year that come off the ground that i don't finish i missed one not that long ago where was that was that the the strenuous life thing was yeah, i think perfect? so okay. uh no i pulled that let's see i pulled that it was the time before that i don't remember we were in tulsa i pulled 655 and got it to mid shin and felt like I strained for five seconds and put it down. And when I watched the video, I strained for one second and right. put it down. This is the problem. That's why you have to have somebody counting. Right. Five, four, three, right? They've got to go through that because you have no concept of time when you start to strain. So it's not okay to miss. You have to learn how to grind through the things, right? You got to learn right. how to grind through the stuff. Now, I miss more presses. Everybody's going to miss more presses yeah, than anything definitely. else because press is so much harder to keep over the middle of your foot. What's, what's that one for you? Every so, three months? I mean, there three are times. Months? Yeah, I mean, and plus, not only that, but I program, you know, that I program press starts a lot. Mm -hmm. And so a press start is essentially a program press miss. That's really what it is, right? So I program a press start, which is, say, 5% to 7% over your actual max after you're done with your press main press work so terrible. you take it out of the rack it's really heavy and you try to press it and you and of course it grinds at your forehead level and you grind and grind and grind and grind and it comes back down you know fails and you rack it and what's weird is usually like the third week people actually press it and hit a pr they accidentally hit like a five percent pr yep and so i'll miss that sometimes because it's easier to you know to kind of misgroove a press a bench i now misgroove is something different right like if that squat gets ahead of it, you know, gets out over your toes or something, you know, there ain't no grinding. Yeah, there's no grinding, although it's you, one of those deals where I rarely miss groove a squat to the point that I'm, I fail one. I rarely groove one. Correctly? Right. <laughs> you, you, you know, miss groove all of them. Right. Or a press, you know, you throw it out ahead of you, you know. Yeah, that, all, you know, right. That's it comes different. back down and then you hit it again. But yeah, the thing where you start to grind on it, you grind for one second, you decide you can't get it, let it come right. back down. You don't get to decide. Like you, right. your brain doesn't get to decide when you miss your body has to decide when you miss 
what is amazing, one of the things we've actually learned from CrossFit, from guys like Rich Froning, is they realize that their brain is actually a limiting factor with right, this stuff. Right. It's not your body. Your body will go further. So make your body grind as long as it possibly can. Push through that membrane. Right. And Push. if it misses, it's because your body actually missed, not because your brain allowed it to miss, not because you gave up on it. So that five seconds of grind becomes an enormous, it is something that it actually is probably, if we can point to a singular thing that is the thing that happens during this refining process that makes us better, like that's the thing, right? right? When you learn how to grind on a deadlift for five, six, seven seconds, something changes in you, right? When you blow your first blood vessel in your eye, right? Right. When you literally sh your pants for the first time. And look, like I understand those of you guys are listening to this thing and you're like, I've never blown a blood vessel in my eye. I've never shown my pants. I don't want to show my pants. I don't want to blow. Yeah, but, me either. Like, yeah, me neither. And I totally get it. Right. And it still happens insanely rare. It's not like this happens like every week. This is not mm. like a standard thing that happens. But like, if you've been training for two or three years and you've never accidentally shit your pants a little bit, you've never sharded. You haven't strained. Right. Everybody sharts a little bit. If you're a female and you haven't pissed yourself. It's like an REM song, right? Yeah, right. Everybody sharts. Yeah. If you haven't if you haven't had some incontinence from straining on a heavy deadlift or a heavy squat, sure. you probably haven't actually strained enough. Right. Right. Especially if you've had kids. Especially right. if you've given birth vaginally to kids. Like you're you're gonna I know when I had kids, that's when it really started. For right, me. of course, right. Yeah. I mean, there's even if you don't blow blood vessels in your eyes, anytime I do a powerlifting meet. I blow little blood vessels in my eyelids. Right, right, I have little right. dots of red, little red dots in my eyelids because of the strain. And so 500 pounds doesn't do it. For me, it takes like 550 or over. I've described this a, a couple times before. I take the weight out of the rack and I walk back. And the second I start my descent, usually there's music playing. It's that a meet, you know, so there's, I've got loud metal music. As I start to descend, the music drops an octave, right? Like it's, you can hear the beat and it's, that 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 that, that mm, 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 mm. it does that yeah and then my eyesight the interest so the first thing that goes as i start to descend in a squat is my hearing and the next thing that goes is my eyesight so my, i can see fine at the top as i start to descend it all turns red and in the bottom it goes black and i can see nothing so in the bottom it's almost like you're at the bottom of the ocean where those like Whoa. insane pressure the sound is really weird, you know, and uh, and you can see nothing. And then as you come up out of the hole in the bottom of the squat, the octave starts, the key starts to raise in the music and the sight starts to come back. And at the top, I can see again and I put it back in. And it's usually still I can see red by the time I rack it back. Yeah, and get the red. Yeah, I get red. It's weird. And so I get tunnel vision like it closes in from the sides. Yeah, which I mean, it and makes then, sense. Uh, you know, then sometimes it'll go completely black. I can't hear anything. Yeah. Like people are like, oh, what song do you want? I don't care. Yeah. It doesn't I don't matter. care. Yeah. Put on Barney. I don't care. Like <laughs> right. I can't hear anything. Yeah. That's why we yell all the time. You know, you're yelling at your client and everybody around is like, oh God, this guy's terrible. Yeah. They right. can't hear they you. Can't hear anything. I get in trouble more than anybody at the meets because I'm yelling at every client. I'm the coach. Like I'm trying to talk to my lifter. And you can't and talk to him. You have to scream at no, him. No, you got to scream at him. They won't let me be on the it. platform. So I'm 20 feet away. So I'm screaming at him trying to get it and i understand but like i really don't care what everybody else thinks i want to lift her to complete the lift and so right. you know they've got to be able to hear my voice my voice has to be loud so this five second grind thing is a big deal being able to learn how to grind is the most refining thing you can do in the process of the end of lp and going in your intermediate training so y'all be honest with yourselves be brutally honest you know did you give it everything think about what was your experience like as you failed you know you know if you had a sharper shooting pain okay I'll give you that one, maybe. Sure. But but if you're just like, gosh, you know, I don't think I can do any more. Well, yeah. then you probably didn't grind, right? What was your experience when I actually was able to sit down and get some distance from the lift and they say, what was my experience? I realized, like, psychologically, I felt like there was nothing to push against. Yep. Well, then that gave me some information. You know, I could yep. do something with that. And by the way, I'm like a middle intermediate by the time I start to have those experiences. I didn't have those in my 11th week of LP. Right. Right. It's like, you know, set five of whatever Reynolds gave me, you know. Right. But, um, you know, yeah, be it's brutally be, honest. With I was going to say, it's important to be brutally honest and vulnerable. Right. So if it's okay, like we all still sometimes give up early, we just have to recognize that it's not, not okay to give up early. Right. So if you give up early, be honest 
with yourself and say, you know what? I, I watched the video. I felt like I strained for five seconds. I strained for a second and a half. That wasn't enough. And next time I have to know if I don't have somebody counting down for me, yeah. it might feel like you have to strain for 10 or 15 seconds to actually be five seconds. That's right. There's a time warp when it's heavy. That's right. You can't get it. So the key is everybody's going to make this mistake. Everybody's going to have times where they don't pull hard enough or long enough or whatever, give yep. up early on whatever rep. That in and of itself is not a huge problem as long as you recognize it when you do it so that you know to work on the thing. Like, oh, you know what? I felt like I strained that long. I didn't. Brutal honesty. Brutal honesty. Hey, Barbell Logic listeners. This is 2020 Matt. Early on in the Barbell Logic podcast, we released an episode entitled Embracing the Grind, and that was episode 27. So it was very early. And while we felt that this was a message that lifters needed to hear, we actually received some backlash. People thought that we were saying, hey, you need to grind your lifter into powder. And so we actually released an answer to that episode in episode 43 originally that we called a clarification, which was a clarification to the Embracing the Grind episode, just to clarify and expand from that earlier podcast. So what you've been listening to is the original Embracing the Grind episode. And what we're going to transition into now is the episode on a clarification where we go into and explain a little bit deeper why we don't grind ourselves into powder, but why it's really, really important to still learn how to grind and really do hard things. So enjoy. To clarify some of the points that we've tried to make about intermediate programming, that kind of social media controversy really is rooted, I think, in misunderstanding of our position. And we wanted to clear that up because, well, we want to be good communicators. So let's yeah. do that, man. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think first off is an understanding of who we coach. So an important note is who, who I coach and who you coach and who we coach. And also the following as a whole is heavily weighted with novices and early intermediates and middle age and older people. Right? Yeah, I think that's a crucial, I mean, that, that may be the crucial, I don't know, point about the way we like to train people is that we don't just really train a lot of normal people. Yeah. And frankly, a lot of not terribly athletic people. Yeah. And a lot of people that are older than you'd think they'd be. Yeah. Yeah. Our average age is 38. Yeah. That's average. That, I mean, we've got, we do have clients who are 17 and 18 and 21 and whatever. And 70. And 71 and 72. But the average age of the client that is 38. Also, let me be really clear. After running Strong Gym, by the way, you just reminded me that I sold Strong Gym two years ago today. Yeah. Uh, and I Congratulations. Didn't, I didn't even think, you know, last year I thought about it a lot. But I ran Strong Gym and Strong Gym was a gym for lifters. And I did the best I could to market that gym to the general population. But ultimately, it was a gym for serious people. I, it even continued to surprise me as it grew the percentage of people that were that would consider themselves competitive of the thousand people at Strong Gym that went to Strong. 250 of them were competitive, 250, 300 were competitive lifters. That's an enormous population, percentage of population of the people. And so here's a monoliths there. Oh yeah, we had, yeah, we had all kinds of, you know, all the uh, monoliths and strongman stones. And we had, I mean, we, we had, had competitive it. power lifters and competitive strongmen, competitive bodybuilders and competitive crossfitters. I mean, like actual competitive crossfitters. A bunch of 700 pound deadlift men. Yeah, we had a 21 700 pound yeah. deadlifters at Strong Gym. And I want to be super, super clear because this is a clarification episode. I don't want to coach those people. Now, I'm not saying that I don't ever want to coach any of those people. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that, first off, how many late intermediate and advanced lifters are there in the whole world? 5,000? I mean, uh, I don't know. Not that many. Right. How many lifters are classified less than that, right? Not beginners, novices, whatever. Most. 8 billion. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's a better business plan for me. It's a better business plan. Yeah. I want to get normal people strong. Yeah. And beyond business plan, it's just really gratifying to take someone with a 95 pound squat to 290. Absolutely. You know, or and, and 375. That's, that's, that's great work to do. Absolutely. I have turned lots of the guys at Strong Gym that deadlifted 700 pounds would tell you that I was super integral in that. That's not that I was the guy that's totally, you know, wasn't all on me. Sure. Right but I know how to coach people and get them strong. And I've got some super high-end athletes that I coach. But ultimately, what I'm trying to do from a big picture perspective 
is I'm trying to get people who aren't strong and make them strong. I'm not trying to get people who are already strong and make them like world class strong. Right? right. So that's not what I'm talking about. Yeah. So when we when we make when we discuss programming or well, really anything here, we're really talking about all of those little over seven billion people who aren't advanced or maybe aren't even intermediate yet. Sure. So I mean, I think that's a crucial distinction. You know, half of the people are below average. <laughs> yeah. You know, and actually about 80%, I mean, we don't really know how to graph out the athletic ability of the entire population, sure. but roughly 80% of people are going to be in the standard deviation around average and below. Yep. And that's something that we just can't get around. You know, that about 80% of the people that we end up coaching are going to be of average or, or less below. athletic ability. Yeah. And, and so it's not just athletic ability. It's also, you know, gosh, you know, their age, you know, so this curve, that would be for everybody in the population at their age. And then the older they are, the farther left they end up on the total curve of athletic yeah. ability. Yeah, of course. So, you know. Yeah, you start looking so that's at, like, that's where we come testosterone from. Testosterone and neuromuscular efficiency and things like that. And so, yeah, so that it's important to understand that the people that we're primarily coaching are novices, even absolute beginners, pre-novice. But we get a lot of people now at online coaching who are not even novices yet, right? Yeah. They're like, I've never touched a barbell. I don't know. Yeah, so that's interesting. So like a pre-novice, we've never talked about this. That's I would say beginner. that that's somebody, man. So when, when you said that, I thought, oh yeah, those are the people that can't squat to depth. Like they're so detrained, they're 66, yeah. they're a lady with five children, and they're so detrained we can't get them to depth and they have to squat to the box for, you know, 95 yeah, days. Yeah, or they are just have never performed a, the lift ever. Right. Like even, it doesn't even have to be like detrained, old, can't squat to depth. It may be somebody who can, yeah. who just never has yet. Yeah. And as soon as they're their first couple workouts in, in online coaching, it certainly takes a little bit longer to get them performing the lifts within, say, 95, 90, 95% yeah. of correct. And so we can do that. As a matter of fact, almost the first thing we do when a beginner signs up is we do a Skype call with them and we try to set them up with an in-person coaching session. We find someone for them to see in person first. Yeah. And we start going from there. So that's primarily who we coach. And I just want to be clear about it. That's who I love. That's who my heart is for yeah. at this point. I love watching 50-year-old guys get their quality of life back because of the way the way they train, because of the way we've coached them. And so I think it's super cool to watch people deadlift 800 pounds. Oh, man, I cry when they do. That's yeah, it's moving. awesome. It's awesome. It's just such a small percentage of the population. And also, to just be honest, from a business perspective, and I, I just want to be super transparent, that population also doesn't have any money. <laughs> but it's true. Well, I mean, it's just that like competitive a... lifters don't have any money as a whole. Like, are there competitive lifters out there that have a little bit of money? Yes. But I'm not interested in being juggernaut. So, you know, if we say, gosh, we're training a lot of folks that aren't athletic, then that drives everything, you know, and that they are novices. And I'll just go ahead and try to clarify this one. Sure. We don't think every set should be an RPE 10, 10 max effort set for the rest of your life. No. This person who's a novice and really doesn't know how to do the hard, hard work. Yep. So here's what I see in a new trainee very often. The, the deadlift gets to 275 or 295, something like that for a dude. And he sets up, shins are one inch from the bar, humps over, grabs the bar, shins the bar, sets his back, goes, make, takes a big breath. <gasps> And he pulls, he sets it down. Yep. He goes, mm, and then puts it down. Yep. And then he scratches his head and he walks a lap around the barbell. <laughs> and then he goes and sets up, gets tight, mm, sets it down. Yep. We have to teach that guy that, you know, you got to be patient with that, yep. you know, it's and, that, take some time. and it's not going to pull your back into like Gumby, yep. you know, and so that's what that grind is about. We would never tell, we would never tell anybody Every last rep needs to be an RP ten. No, no, yeah. no, no, no. But in fact, we use RPEs in combination with weight sets and rep prescription or percentage set and rep sure. prescription, depending on how advanced they are. And say, look, you're going to do you know eighty five percent for uh, three sets of four, and it should be about an eighty RP eight. Yeah, it should be RP eight, which means that as a communication tool. If you get in there and you, your 85% is not RPE8, right? You start getting in there, you do your first couple sets, and it's like an RPE6. We got to go up on the weight a little bit. 
Or if it's an RP nine and a half or 10, we've got to come down a little bit. It's not where it's supposed to be. And so there are certainly times when we program, we want, whether we actually call it an RP 9.5 or 10, or whether we don't use the RP at all, and we just say it's going to be heavy and we're going to grind. Like it's okay, right? So it's the, like, I want my clients to grind at a competition. Yeah. I want them to know what it's like before they have to pull their third deadlift at a competition to grind. Now, I don't want them grinding six days out from the competition, right? But they have to have learned how to do that. And right. so every advanced lifter that I've ever seen has learned how to do this. You watch them, they learn how to, as a matter of fact, man, as I come back from my own training, like I can remember just about every 700 pound deadlift and over I've ever pulled required some amount of, of grind, like some serious grind, sure. right? And every time I, you know, get hurt or travel and take vacations and, and miss some training and come back and I kind of yep. do my own version of LP, there is always some days in there where I give up too early. Yeah. yeah because so I haven't retaught I, myself how to grind yet. I want to put a point on that. So when you go to a meet and you pull an RP, you pull a 705, whatever. Yeah. We are not talking about that. We're talking about the guy right. in his ninth, 11th, 12th week of LP. Yep. And he's going to pull a deadlift set that you and I know is an RPE 7. Yep. We know that's, that's what exactly it is. Right. And he grabs the bar. He's already doing switch grip. You know, he's already got reverse grip. Right. And he goes and sets it down. Yep. Pump. Yep. Pump. We're not even trying to get him to do max effort. We're trying to teach him that, guy, that, it's, that it's okay to do it. How can that guy ever get to the point where we can say, hey, man, you should sign up for your first competition. And even if his deadlift at the competition is 315, how can you ever trust that he's going to be able to go out and deadlift what he's capable of deadlifting if every time he gets to an RPE 7 or 8, he puts the bar down and doesn't do it? But so the thing is, you have to understand is people going through these novice progressions Every single day on deadlift, once you're six weeks into the program, is the heaviest thing you've ever picked up ever in your whole yeah. life. Yeah. And they're not used to it. And so your brain has got this factor that goes, oh, shit, it's too heavy. Put it down. And so when I say learn how to grind or give me five seconds to grind, what I'm talking about is I can't let you pull on it for a half second, set it back down. It's right. going to be hard. And by the way, because we're dealing with 80% of our people being average or below, the rate of force development is low. Their neural efficiency is low. Like they wouldn't have high vertical jumps, which means it's going to take longer for them to apply 100% of force of their potential force to the barbell, right? Like good athletes, they're explosive. They go from zero to 100% fast. Right. And average and below go from zero to 100% slow. I pressed four sets of four last night at 180. Yeah. That last set, every rep probably took eight seconds. Yeah. Oh, wait, four sets of four? That's not like low volume, right? Yeah. But all my reps are slow is what I'm saying. Yeah, sure. But, yeah, but, because th but that's the grind. Because you're way on the left end so, of the athletics. So, <laughs> well, I am. Yeah, I know. Yeah. You know, and I'm not the only one, but that's the grind thing. You know, sure. we're not telling everybody, hey, man, you go out there, you do full intensity, one grinder rep every second. No, 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 yep. no, no. Our friends who are novices, we want to teach them how to exert yep. so that later on they can reach new heights and find out new things about themselves. Yep. And then, you know, our idea when we proposed this podcast is that we would go through this stuff in a stepwise fashion yeah, in a logical way. And, you know, we've gotten some of these episodes out of order, you know, because of really production problems most of the time. But sometimes we thought, oh, gosh, we need to go back and do a topic. But we're trying to mostly get them in order. And so the concepts, we're trying to present them in the order that the concepts would come to the new lifter. Yep. Right. So early on, we're like, hey, why strength? Well, that's the first thing you got to think of. And then sure. we did an episode about equipment and shoes and stuff sure. like that. Linear yeah. progression. And, right. Yeah. So thus far, we're still we, real early. We're real early. We're not talking about middle intermediates. No. Nope. We're not talking about late earlies. We're right. certainly not talking about people who are advanced lifters. So anything they, that we've said right now and you say, hey, you know, what about Lillibridge? Okay. What, what about him? Maybe we can get him on the show someday. Sure. But we're not talking about advanced lifters. Does he lifters know how to yet. grind? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of course he knows how to grind, right? So we're talking about teaching people how to grind. We're talking about my mother. Yeah, we're literally exactly talking about, talking about mom. your mom. We're not no. talking about Eric Lillibridge needs to learn how to grind his deadlifts every time he pulls. We're talking about, I know that guy knows how to do this. Right. I know that guy knows what RP 10 or RP 9.5 is. And you know who else knows how to do it? A 25-year-old guy 
that played high school football at a 6A school in the South. That's right. He knows how to do it too, probably. Yeah, sure. It's not that guy. Wrestlers, like people yeah. who, who've already done like really mentally hard stuff, they've been forced to do that. So yeah, so the- so You know, the a guy that played Division II lacrosse probably knows how to. I mean, yep. really, these guys are above average athletic ability. And as a result, they've been put in athletic situations where they've learned how to do this. Former military guys. Sure. Maybe firemen. I mean, there are people that know how to do this, but there's a huge cohort of people, you know, that the word in this knowledge worker economy that don't. Yep. And so that's what it's about. But enough of that, that grind. Okay. Let's talk volume. <laughs> so we already said that we're talking to these people. We're trying to make our points in the order that the new lifter would encounter these concepts yep. or encounter these challenges. So we just did a deal about a programming philosophy in the title of it is for early intermediates. Yep. And which means we, immediately post LP. Right. You shoot craps on your squat two sessions in a row at the end of LP. Now you're an intermediate. Sure. You answered the three questions. You're eating, you're resting, yep. blah, blah, blah. Yep. You're an early intermediate. Yep. That's who we're talking about. Right. And so for that guy, we don't pile on the volume yet. No, that's what we do. It's not the only way to skin no, that cat. No, you can cat. get strong by doing volume. As a matter of fact, hell, you it, do if, get strong doing it. That's right. If we didn't communicate this well talking about it's certainly this. our fault it's our fault so I, I want to be clear all three of the major variables intensity frequency and volume can be used to drive the strength adaptation yep. There's no doubt right that can't be done forever all by themselves they're not the singular thing that will drive it forever in the beginning as we walk through a systematic progression in this podcast Volume stays exactly the same for all of LP, right? It's three sets of five. It is not a volume dependent program. Right. Frequency stays exactly the same through all of LP, right? You're gonna squat three times a week. You're gonna pull three times a week, whether those are deadlifts or you might start all deadlifts. And you're gonna do some form of pressing, press or bench three times a week. That's the way it works. The frequency is the same. The only thing that is the variable that moves in LP is intensity. It keeps right. going up until it can't. Right. Now and here's so, the question. Go ahead. Well, so. You know, I had a guy ask me some questions, this civil conversation, by the way, over DMs and social media. He said, well, isn't LP, isn't it volume driven? And I said, no, because we, we, don't, we don't manipulate the volume. The right. only thing we manipulate is the intensity. He says, no, it's not the intensity because it's not a percentage of their one rep max. And I'm like, well, okay, intensity in this case is a proxy for the weight. So yep. it's the weight. The weight's sure. the only thing we change. Yep. And he says, well, yeah, it's the volume. I'm sorry, the tonnage, in fact. And I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll give yeah, you that. Yeah, tonnage is great. Let's, but, but we're doing three times five. Yeah, volume is just the number, right? The weight. That's right. And so the weight is what's driving So in, in week one of LP, how many work sets in week one of squat do you do? Yeah, nine work sets. You do nine work sets. Three sets of five on Monday, three sets of five on Wednesday, three sets of five on Friday, right? right? In week 10, if you're still in LP, how many work sets of squats do you do? Probably going to do nine. You do nine, right? So the volume hasn't changed. Now, has the intensity changed? 2x. And since the intensity has changed and the volume has not, has the tonnage changed? Absolutely. Of course, because tonnage is a product of volume times intensity. So and since the intensity has gone up, the volume stayed the same, the tonnage has gone up. And you can argue that the thing that is actually driving the strength adaptation is the tonnage. That's yep. totally fine. Guys, it's probably true. It's, it's definitely true. That's yep. the thing. Right now, here's the thing. Is there a time when tonnage can no longer be driven up? And I would argue yes, because at some point, like a time for the novice, there is a time at the end of LP when I can't keep driving weekly tonnage up, right? I can't, right? Okay, I can. If I drop my percentages down to 75%, right. I do a million sets of it, right? 75, 78, 81, right? I can't. And I might actually continue to be able to get stronger that way. But here's the other way I know to get stronger. If in LP, I can add intensity, add weight every single session until I can't, then can I go to training where I add intensity once a week? Yes. Yeah. That's what Texas Method, Old Man Texas Method, Heavy Light Medium. That's what those things are. Then can I get to a point where I can add intensity once every two weeks? Yes, I can still do, I can do a four-day yep. split, Texas Method split, spread it out over two weeks and still make progress once every two weeks. Then, can I increase intensity once a month? Yes, I can increase intensity once a month via 531 version or whatever, any other four, like there's lots of places there's to, bunch of, bunch yeah, to right? Those, and they're all acceptable, they're fine, right? And then, can I get to a point where I increase intensity once every two months or three months? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Will this last forever? No. 
reminder, who are we talking to? Early intermediates. Early intermediate. Right. So at some point, you have to start manipulating the other variables. But the point that I'm making is, is that it is far more enjoyable to the lifter and far more productive for the coach and the business owner who doesn't want to get fired add intensity as long as you can and hold off on volume as long as you can before you bring in the volume or frequency increase in programming. Because once you start to increase volume, when that becomes the variable that must be increased, and yes, I totally agree, at some point with advanced programming or even late intermediate programming, Volume is going to have to be the driver. And by the way, it's still probably tonnage, right? It volume is going to help you get hypertrophy, extra, mm -hmm. you know, more contractile mm -hmm. tissue and more contractile tissue, which is good. Certainly, and absolute yeah, good. more muscle. Great. There's nothing wrong with that. But once that becomes the thing, I can't just keep going up in weight anymore, and it has to be volume. Then it's volume, yeah. and the problem with that is, is it becomes less and less enjoyable. And it takes longer and longer to do. And remember that who I'm dealing with primarily, both personally and at my business, are normal people who are not interested in competing in powerlifting long term. It's certainly not as their primary goal in life. And so a three hour workout or a two and a half hour workout or even a two hour workout where they're doing six sets of five on squats is not something they're interested in. Now, at some point, I'm probably going to have to have them do six sets of five. As a matter of yep. fact, you are late intermediate lifter, early advanced lifter, certainly probably early advanced for a guy that's as far left on the athletic spectrum as you are, and you just did a four-week cycle of block training accumulation where I had to do five sets of five. Yep. And you're 42, 43 30, years 43. old, 43 years old, right? You don't have great neuromuscular efficiency, and you're a little bit skinny, and I need to put, I need How to put some, you? well, I mean, you know, so you're lanky, <laughs> lanky, yeah. lanky, lanky is a better word. You're lanky, I need to put muscle on it, and so it was time, but yeah. I wanted to wait as long as I could because once we start driving up that volume, guess what you're going to have to do on the next accumulation yeah. cycle? And Not five sets of five. No, yeah, more volume. Six sets of five yeah. or whatever, more than 25 yeah. work reps. You, you know, so for the long-term development of a trainee, they're going to embrace volume. They're going to have to. Like if you're going to do this for nine years, you're 12 forever. years, five years, four years, yep. three years, for, depending on who you are, you're going to be in the volume land and yeah. that's fine. That is probably the variable that gives us the most bang for our buck for the longest, but we just don't have to go to that. Early That's right. That's exactly for the average dude. Yeah. So the only you know? disagreement we'd have with some other coaches is that we're in a position where we're going to bring in volume as late as we can. And some other coaches are going to bring in volume earlier and neither one is wrong. It's okay. Like bringing in volume earlier than we bring in volume. There's nothing wrong with that. You can still get strong. I just want to hold off as long as I can, because what I've found in my 20 years of coaching is that people like to do intensity as long as they can make progress in intensity. They're happy and I can show them like actual quantifiable results that they're getting stronger because the weight on the bar continues to go up, which is the goal. Yeah. And at the point that it won't, I've got to bring in volume. There are a lot of people say, oh, you don't like it. It's your preference. You don't enjoy it. So it's no good. So you don't enjoy it. So you say it's no good. Not my preference. It still works perfectly fine. <laughs> yeah, well, but they're saying, hey, you you know, they said, you know, I, I got I got hot. I got mad. And then the episode, and they're like, oh, so you don't like it. Right. I mean, you don't enjoy it yourself, so sure. that's why you don't want to give it to other people. And, you know, hey, I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, if I can go and put five pounds on the bar at the end of the week on nine sets or put five pounds on the bar with 20 sets, I'd rather do the nine. Yeah. That, that is my preference. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. That is. Yeah, I know. And then there's another thing. A person who starts training later in life, I would say 40 or older, they start training at 40 or older, um, they detrain at uh, lower intensities. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed this for myself. I noticed this for myself. And, I, and it's really a marked thing that you can see if you train somebody that's in their 70s. Uh, if all I handle is stuff in the 80s, 80%, range especially low 80s yeah 80 to 85 yeah 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 85 and under is probably yeah. more like it if i do two or three weeks you know 80 82 83 84 percent range i mean even for multiple sets across uh i'm not able to hit that one rep pr again right. I, or, I, or probably even something within five percent of that yeah even a 95 percent <laughs> uh for a single is going to be a real a real grind yeah you know i don't 
you're right. You're onto something with this. People that start older than 40. Oh, dude, you know if what you I, started when you were 19 and now you're 45 and you're pulling 625. Yeah. No, that that's yeah, not. No, right. no, no, no. Yep. No, that guy's a little different. Yeah, so think about than, stress. You think about the stress recovery adaptation. I got a guy that I'm coaching now that's in his 40s. The guy deadlifts almost 700. He's doing work sets. He just pulled a, he's doing work sets of three at 585 on his deadlift. Like, man, that's a lot of like stress on your body. Mm -hmm. Like, because it's just, even though it's a, not a super high percentage of what he's doing, you know, even like hot, like sets of five and six at 545 and 535. And so it's lots of stress, right? So right. percentage is a very, percentage is very individual dependent. So I think you're onto something with this older lifter, but I also think that it might be a product of testosterone and oh, sure. neuro, neuromuscular efficiency. Sure. And so, as you are, so I, I think I think females do train under eighty five percent. Yeah, and so why we've had Nikki on the show. We've talked about you know we moved females from five sets of five to sets of three. So instead of three sets of five, pretty so, quick we're going so to move your phrasing five. there was was funky. Okay, from sets of five down to sets of three. Yeah, sorry. So yep. in females in linear progression, we'll start at three sets of five like everybody else. And then yep. relatively quickly, we'll move into five sets of three because we've noticed that they can handle five sets of three at a higher percentage of what would essentially be their one rep max, even though the idea of one rep max for a novice is, yeah. you know, whatever, they change every single day. And that women can handle it and be fine. And that men, it tends to drive men into the ground. Like five sets of three at a really high percentage, say like 92% of what they could actually do would be difficult. And for most women, they can do that. And it's just not that big of a deal. It's just good, solid work and they're fine. And there's something there with the fact that they don't have the neuromuscular efficiency, which is probably due to the lack of testosterone, which is the same thing the old people have. Right. If I do volume with an older, late intermediate advanced lifter, and I'm not talking about a, a late intermediate advanced older lifter who can deadlift 600. I'm talking about a late intermediate advanced older lifter who can deadlift 400, right? So Later immediate advance, decently strong, but not like super strong. I've got to do volume for sets of three and sets of four and not sets of five, six, seven, eight. I can't take an older guy and have him do five sets of eight or four sets of eight or five sets of five. So he tends so to do better at six sets of three. And so the reason for that, well, this is a question. Is the reason for that is because you've got to have any sets of three and four and five so you can have the intensity so higher. So I can have the intensity higher. Because if we pick a rep scheme that he can do for 82%, do that for three or four weeks and the guy's going to lose the top end. That's exactly right. Yeah, that, that's, that's my experience. I don't know why, and I haven't seen any literature that supports this, but my experience tells me that the later the person starts, well, I mean, this makes absolute sense. The later somebody starts, the lower their top sure. end is going to be. Yeah, of course. Um, but man, you know, starting early, even if you're a 55 year old person, the earlier you started, the better off you are. Of course. Flip of that, the later you started, yeah. the worse off. And you can't do be. anything about that, yeah. right? So we we all, it's you know, I started when I was 17 and then people were like, man, I wish I started when I was 17. And I was like, man, I wish I started when I was 14. No, no kidding. Right? Like it doesn't matter when you started you always wish you had started <laughs> earlier, right? right? So like for years, especially in my 20s, when I was a kid, models. I was like, man, I wish I, I'd started before I was 17. I started so late at 17. Right. I, you know, that's kind of what I thought. But So let's make a good argument for volume. Well, the good argument for volume is, is that it's the best driver of hypertrophy, not hypertrophy, as you call it, <laughs> but hypertrophy. And so with muscle growth, with contractile tissue growth, right? Not again, this is all theory sort of stuff, but we know that bodybuilders are huge and aren't necessarily strong. So they've figured out with higher reps, lots of volume, they've been able to add a lot of storage. It's uh, non-contractile storage, it's, right? It's a lot of like glycogen, water. Yeah, it's volume, right? So it's water, glycogen, salt, creatine, storage, all those things. And so I'm talking about as contractile, and obviously they get some contractile. You can't just be a giant bodybuilder and not have increased contractile tissue. Like yeah, you, be, you have, be strong. Right? as volume is going to increase contractile tissue more than anything else, all right? That's all there is to it. And so at some point, I can only be so efficient, I can only be so level of neuromuscular efficiency based on my genetics. I can only continue to increase intensity for so long. I can only continue to add frequency of the lifts and the workouts so much to where I can't recover. Like 
we could argue the same thing. You go, well, you know, you squat three times a week as a novice, and then you go to, you know, a heavy day or a volume day and a light day and a heavy day. And then at some point, maybe as you become advanced, you could squat four times a week and then five times a week and whatever. And it, well, where does it end? I mean, you're going to squat twice a day, five right. days a week. Can't, and the answer is actually yes. That's yes, what the Bulgarians do. do. That's what some of the Olympic weightlifters do. That also isn't real conducive for general, for the, you know, 55-year-old executive that travels three days a week and is training in his garage or at a CrossFit gym at five o'clock in the morning. And so volume works incredibly well to build muscle. And when muscle is built, the ability to produce more force is greater. And so therefore the ability to produce more force is greater. Therefore I can actually get stronger, right? However, how much muscle can be built? We've argued this with 17 year old kids who want to be big and strong bodybuilders and they want to go in and do body part splits and they want to do hammer strength machines. And they want to do all this volume and they're, if they can squat below parallel, their best squat is hundred pounds, 105, like how much hypertrophy can work sets of squats at 95 pounds give somebody like not that much. So we got to get them strong first. And once we get them strong first, we got a good solid base of strength. We start bringing this volume in and we let them build some hypertrophy. So it works just fine. It's just the downside of that volume game is that it makes the workout so much longer. It yeah. requires so much more time. And again, for our executive that time is money because the guy's charging $500 an hour for his job, he is probably never going to be to the point where he's okay with a three hour workout. And by the way, we're also discussing a lot of like perfect theoreticals, right? That 55 year old guy or that 40 year old guy or anybody in there, the chance that they actually ever become advanced is so minusculely low that it's almost not worth arguing about, right? Like, could they? Or right? even later, immediate. Right, like, like, yeah, it just doesn't happen because life happens and they get a prosthetic cyst and then they go in for prostate surgery when they're 50 years old and then they have a grandkid and they decide to go to Hawaii for a month and they miss training and they, you know, their wife gets sick one day and she's sick for two weeks. And they're like, that's just, like, this is just life. This is kind of the thing that happens. And so while certainly there are times when our older populations make it to late intermediate and advanced lifting, the vast, vast majority of our people are going to end at like early intermediates. They're so, going to end at early, as early. And you know what? If you become an early intermediate as a 42 year old guy who's actually gone through LP, you're strong enough. You're, you're strong enough for everything that life is going to throw at you. And if you're strong enough for everything that life can throw at you, then we've done our job. That's when you have to make the decision. We've talked about this with Brett McKay. You then have to make the decision. Do you want to keep getting stronger? If you want to keep getting stronger, the training's going to take longer. We've got to add in a bunch of volume. You're going to risk injury at some point because at some point doing a 600 pound squat on 55 year old knees is probably not, we've swung the pendulum away from super healthy at that point, right? right. But if you're a 50 year old guy and you squat 315 and you deadlift 405, man, you're strong enough for anything that life's going to throw at you. So right? is it possible that the reason that we don't have a lot of guys in their late 40s, for example, get to late intermediate or advanced programming is because we're not putting them on enough volume or yeah, on. no, I don't think so. I mean, I understand that could be the question. I mean, look, man, if we want to use evidence with older people is you keep increasing that the intensity stays high and you hold back on volume as long as you can increase the volume. Now, I did not always agree with that. But after 20 years of coaching for me and coaching the vast majority of people that I coach have been very general population people, not a lot of athletes, I've come to the same conclusion. It just seems to work better than bringing in volume early. So can you bring in volume early and will it work? Yes. Do I like bringing in intensity, continuing to drive intensity for as long as I can until it stops working? Yes. Why? Because the client likes it better because there's more satisfaction in it. It's quantifiable because I can always see the weight on the bar going up. It doesn't take as long to train. And all of those things that occur with your general population, it seems to just make them happy customers and they can continue to be stronger and stronger and stronger until they can't. Yeah. And when they can't, we'll bring in the volume. So here's one more thing that I've seen on the interwebs. People say, hey, why are you even peaking an early intermediate you know, or, or even the late intermediate, you know, they're like the peaking time, frankly, detracts from training because it does, you know, you work up, you take a little deload to rest, then you peak, sure. and then you probably get a rest after the thing. So if you want to go get a squat PR, you probably lose five or six squat sessions that could be productive training in order to get that peak. And they're yep. like, hey, 
just get them stronger and don't do these peaks. Why are you doing those peaks? It's wasting their time. It's BS anyway. Sure. Why do you think? Well, I'll just speak for myself. I want to see it. You know, I want to pull 500. I don't want to, I'm not really excited about my three by five deadlift PR. Yeah. I I mean, I am proud of that. I like it, you know, Sure. but you know, I really want to see that absolute number go up. I like doing it. It's part of the game for me. Yeah. So it's, and I'm projecting, I assume my clients do too. Yeah. And I mean, my experience would be the same. So the mental confidence that's gained in hitting PRs via intensity PRs rather than volume or frequency. No, nobody ever comes up to me and is like, I'm so excited. I bench pressed four times this week, right? right? Even though some of my clients bench press four times in a week or tonnage, I had an all time tonnage PR or I my like rep. seeing those though. Yeah, I it's do. fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Or my rep max calculator says that I finally am deadlifting over 500 pounds. Like, I don't know that anybody's ever actually told me that nobody's ever walked up to me and said, you know, or any of my clients be like, you know what? I've putting this in the rep max calculator forever. And I'm finally over a 500 pound deadlift. Cause I go, well, you're not over a 500 pound deadlift. <laughs> Not until you actually pull over 500 yeah. pounds. And so, yeah, it's just mental confidence that I want somebody to know the joy that they receive and the value that they get from hitting PRs is worth it to me to lose a couple weeks of that sort of volume training, grind, multiple sets across for a few weeks to give them that a few times a year. It's worth it. And by the way, this is the same reason we you encourage our clients to compete, be in a meet, even right. ones that aren't. And by the way, like, you know, well-known coaches like singles too. Like there's a lot of guys that push for volume that still do singles and then they do volume. So there's something that happens. I I just think that there's something different when you get a heavy single on your back that's not physical, it's mental. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to take 600 pounds out of the squat rack and walk it out. And all that that I'm learning about myself, I want to learn about myself with that 600 pounds on my back in my garage or my basement the first time. I don't want to learn that about myself <laughs> on a platform in front of 200 naked. people. No, man, I'm, I'm not interested in learning a lot of it. And so when I step on a platform, if I hit a PR on a platform, and I have lots of times, it's usually a small one or it's a surprise, right? Or it's, a, it's like a holy, you know, I did better than I thought. And so for me, I think that you learn things about yourself. I think that there's a big difference between a 99%, 100%, 101, somewhere in there, percent rep and a 94% rep, or 94 for a double, or 93 for a double, or somewhere like that. There's actually a big difference. You put that weight that you've never felt before in your life, on your back, in your hands, and there's something that occurs. You learn a lot about yourself, about do I have the the balls to grind through this thing, to struggle through it, and not even like an actual six-second grind. I mean, is it just like, hey, this is sometimes a little bit scary, and I want to build up the mental confidence in myself and in my lifters so that they know when it's time to be on the platform, they've already done this stuff, right? right. Like maybe they even haven't actually hit that weight, but they've, they've played with singles before. We know what to expect. We know what to expect out of a single. They're prepared. There's a different kind of toughness that we discover. Maybe not. Maybe it's the same kind of toughness, but there's another way to discover that too, which will be in that seventh set of five at 84%. Yeah. That teaches you something about yourself, too. Yeah, that's grueling. Yep. You know, when you've got six sets of five or seven sets of five and you get done with three of those sets, you're like, man, I'm really tired. Right. You're like, and I got four more sets. So yeah, I like it. I've when done you, that, too. Right. right. I've like, okay, I've done two sets or I've done five sets and now I have two more. Like, I did I did what I normally do. Now I have two more. Yeah, <laughs> like, right. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So, so now it's good. So, yeah. So hopefully we've clarified some stuff about intensity, volume, you know, percentage we train at, grinding, things like that. Again, you know. Quick recap. We don't want everybody to grind all the time. Nope. We just want you to know how to grind. Learn we how want to do you to, hard work. That's right. Learn how to work hard. We don't believe that volume is bad. We believe that volume can certainly, for long-term gains, volume is the thing that certainly can be driven forever. Yep. Volume can be driven forever. The problem is, is that once you start driving volume, that's the thing that's got to be driven forever. And so I want to hold off on it as long as I can and drive intensity as long as I can until I have to bring in volume. And so I, I, can to, already, I, I can already anticipate a little hair splitting. Yeah. So, you know, even when, well, almost anybody that's programming for volume, they're still doing heavy singles and stuff in there. That's sure. part of it. You know, intensity mixed with those, you know, 80 to 85, maybe 75 and to 85% still... sets are still in there. Yep. So don't say that, oh, well, you know, Reynolds says, well, once you become advanced, then it's only volume. No, no, no. no. You're still going to do that. And also everybody that preaches volume 
also runs volume and intensity on our inverse relationship. Right. So there's times when they have extremely high volume and, and they may be running volume at 76 to 82 percent. But by the time they're getting ready for the meet, it's not 76 to 82 percent anymore. And it's right. not high volume anymore. So, you know, most people that really like high volume training, as they approach the meet, the volume still comes down, the intensity still goes up. And so you're really looking at the periods of what we call like loading periods or fatigue periods or transmutation periods or any of the intensification periods. Those are all kind of the same so sort of works. thing. And what we're doing is we're driving the necessary stress that's needed to push for the adaptation. Right. So, so volume is the training variable that maybe works the longest. Yeah, it is. It is yeah. the training variable that works the longest. Yes, yeah, this is right? awesome. And the quantifiable thing is the intensity, yeah. right? Like intensity is the thing that quantifies whether it worked or not. Right. And so yeah, in the so, beginning, intensity is the thing that we know that Wednesday worked because Friday we're able to go up and we know that Friday worked because Monday we're able to go up and so on and so forth. And you just can't do that forever. So eventually when you're on a three month program, the intensity has to go up on the last day. So we don't want everybody grinding every rep at an RPE 10. Yeah. <laughs> we don't hate volume as a training a programming modality. No, yeah. I hate it. At I all. hate training volume personally. Don't like to, in my right. own training, right. but I use it all the time. Right, because it works. We know it works. Yep. And then we're trying to keep in mind that the person that we're talking to here through this microphone is probably uh, probably just getting started and has questions about what it's like beyond where they are now. Yep. Not where they will be in five years, yep. but you know what's the next step. So we're talking to an average person, and this average person is probably a little older than most people would think. So like you said, the average client is 38. Well, they'd say, well, that's your clients. It's probably pretty close to what it is across the United States. Yeah. You know, if we could somehow find out who handled a barbell this week, the yeah. average age is probably something like that, 35, yeah, probably early 30s, 32, 33, 35. Yeah, so that's who we're talking to. We're talking to somebody that, um, you know, that's really frankly, just getting started. Even if they've been doing this for 18 months, that's just getting started. Yep. You know, I hope that this has clarified a few things. It's probably just put further fuel on the uh, social media fire. I don't know. But for people that had legit questions and not just hatred for us, I hope, I hope this helped clear it up. We certainly don't mean to start any brush fires or uh, throw anybody under the bus. We're just trying to be helpful. And if you don't find it helpful, Man, I'm sorry about that. I really am. I mean, we're just trying to help people, you know? Yeah, we're having a blast, man. Yeah. I, you know, we're able to get this out to lots of people. And ultimately, man, I just want to help normal people get strong. Yeah. And uh, I'm not super interested in coaching all the lifters at nationals and taking them to IPF worlds and USAPL worlds and whatever. It's a ton of fun. Yeah, that's super fun. There's fun to watch. I still love it. I love watching. I'm a fan of the sport. Sure. And I've played those games and I've been there and competed as the lifter and I've coached as the coach. I just, I'm at a point in my life now that I just, I derive more value and more satisfaction and more joy from coaching people who are beginners and novices and making them generally strong and not worrying too much about making somebody a national level lifter. Yeah. So that's us. Yeah. Getting an old lady off the toilet. Yeah. It's awesome. to, it's pretty, pretty good. Yeah. It's, it's great. pretty good. So you know, that's some clarifications. I bet we end up doing one of these episodes every month for the rest of our damn lives. I hope it's not every month. No. We collect them every three or four months. Yeah. Well, four. so this is Barbell Logic. Thanks for listening. You can go and check out the YouTube channel. You can check it out. You can email us at barbelllogicpodcast at gmail.com. You can follow us on all that social media stuff, but tell a friend and help us all spread the word. So thanks for listening. Talk to you soon.